We didn't die. I don't know why, but we didn't die. They get really paranoid. And this guy that I was with, he was a real paranoid type. And I'd gotten to the point where I didn't care and I could just say, ah, you got stuck to the window disease because people that are paranoid, they keep looking out the window and, what's that light down there? Because we're out in the country, out my dad's farm where I inherited, you know. He said, what's that light down there? What's that light? And I'd say, it's just the neighbor's light. <laughs> and you're seeing the trees move in front of it. It looks like it's moving because they were all scared to death that the police were going to come, you know. Or, and, uh, well, this night, this guy was paranoid and I had guns and so, Okay, here's a gun. We walk through the house to see, uh, just to get him off, to get him to calm down. And I walked to the one end of the house, and there's a corner there, and I walked, and, there, and right at this corner, someone was standing at that corner, and I'm holding a gun. And uh, it was my wife. And she was hiding in the house, because she was ticked off at me for leaving and not coming back. And, and that... I remember just th thinking, this can't go on. It flipped, it really freaked me out because I was just, I was just playing a game, you know, and this game was starting to get serious. At, at another point, somebody held a gun on me and threatened to kill me. Uh, my dad heard about this, this incident with my wife and my friend who were walking around the house with a gun. Somehow, I think his, my friend's grandpa heard about it because his wife told him, them, and my dad and, and the counselor and my wife and I met, and he said, you know, I thought you could do this with outpatient counseling, but I think, yeah, I think you maybe go to, need to go to this place, this inpatient place. And I was so defeated at that point that I said, okay. But my son's coming down from South Dakota. Could I see him? Because it was Christmas. And they actually let me do that, let me stay out for like three days, and I went in right after Christmas. And the scripture is Romans uh, 724. I have tried everything. I'm sorry. I, uh, these are tears of joy as well as sadness and grief. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? I walked into this treatment center, and this guy was there, this counselor, he's kind of a smart alecky jerk. I didn't really like him very well at first. Still don't like him very well, but I love him because he's helped, helped me with this. And they did the 12 steps, which that includes a God of the belief in God. But after it, they searched all my bags, and just like you'd see on intervention, right? I mean, it was exactly like that. They searched all my bags. It was a 30-day treatment program, and they had a family week, but they searched all my bags, and then they had me sit waiting in this other room, and this other guy that had been there like for two or three weeks came in to talk to me. This, he was just another resident. And he said, hey, he introduced himself, and I said, you know, I'm not in the best feeling very good right now. I'm thinking, I'm dead. You know, I won't be able to do any of this, because I had completely lost the idea that I could ever change. I thought I was going to be dead by the time I was 30. I was 28. And this guy said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, jerk. I'm because I drink too much and do too many drugs. And he said, well, you want to quit, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, but in my mind, that wasn't even an I, There's no way for me to do that. I couldn't quit because I was going to die if I quit. I couldn't have a life without it. I completely convinced myself there wasn't anything, any way to do it. I had tried to quit, and it wouldn't work. So I just had resigned myself. This is just going to have to happen. He said, well, you could do it for an hour, couldn't you? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, but there was got to be something wrong with that, right? And then he said, you could do it for one hour, and then you could do it for another hour, and pretty soon you got 24 of those hours, and you go to bed and get up the next day and start over. And there's a whole bunch of us who are trying to do the same thing, and you can go to our meetings and join us, and we'll all work together. And there was something, it's so weird, and I've told you guys, some of you guys this before, but it's so weird, it's just like this, there was this room inside of my head that I had locked the door, that had been locked. I don't know if I locked it. I helped lock it, but it had been locked by the addiction itself. Or another, well, one is, there's this door, and then suddenly that door un came unhinged. And it really did feel kind of unhinged because it felt like, wait a minute, could this be possible? Am I going crazy here? Is this guy nuts? Could this really happen? And, but it was like also like a light bulb came on in this dark room, this little light bulb, this little skinny bulb of hope. And I was able to. I, I bought it. 
I thought, well, why not? I've tried, that's why I told my, my wife, she's my ex-wife now, but I told my wife at the time, I, she didn't want me to go because she was scared to death. And she was sitting out on a farm where a drug distributor lives, and somebody, people had broken into our house already and stole our stuff. And they'd gone to my friend's house and threatened him and his wife and said, we're going to come back with more money, for more money later. And we knew people that killed people. I mean, I know people. I came up later in the paper, this one guy that I got the cocaine from, he had murdered several people, suspected of murdering several people. He was murdered himself in the process of killing somebody. I mean, we knew people that were very crazy. Um, and she didn't want me to leave. She was scared to death. And I said, look, I've tried everything else. She just wanted me to control it because that's the only way she could see that I would ever get any better. And I said, look, I've tried everything else. Why not? Because even getting high didn't work anymore. It was just a job. I'd get up in the morning and go to the, the quick shop and buy beer so I didn't run out and make sure on Saturday night I bought more so I wouldn't run out there on Sunday because I couldn't run out of it. I'd feel horrible if I ran out of it. And so I, I, here I am in the 30-day treatment program and I'm buying it. And the first week you can't call you anybody. And, I, and when I was allowed that phone call, I was just eating this stuff up. I was reading the big book. They were telling my story. It was like I was reading this, and it's like, it's about, that's me. That's me. That's me. It was so weird. That's why I believe in the disease concept, because a disease has a, sim a set of symptoms. That's how we think of it. And, the, and I think more than a disease concept, but the disease concept for me at that time worked really well, because there's a set of symptoms, and if you have this symptom, this symptom, you have nine out of ten of them, pretty well, you know, you fit. You, you're, the label fits you. Well, that label fit me like a glove. I was a, I was a classic alcoholic. I didn't know it. I went through physical withdrawal. I didn't believe it at the time. I thought it was because I drank too much juice in the treatment center. But I was sicker than a dog for a week. I, would, I kept selling, telling my counselor, I got the flu. I drank too much juice. It wasn't until six months out of the treatment center, listening in an AA meeting to somebody describing withdrawals and realizing I was physically withdrawal. Because there was a part of me that still wanted to hang on that I'm Cecil View's son, and Cecil View's son doesn't get physically addicted to alcohol. It caused me problems, but it wasn't that bad. See, I wanted to hang on to this one little shred, and that shred, by being in the meetings, finally got opened and revealed, and I was able to admit it. Yeah, I was. And it was kind of relieved, because it was like, oh, that's what that was. Oh, my counselor was right. Oh, now I know why they wanted me to go to halfway house because I was going back home to a house where I was just had been distributing drugs and a wife who wasn't in recovery yet. And but I just wanted to go home with my little girl and my little boy and my, my little girl and my little boy who didn't live with me, he lived in South Dakota, so that wasn't an issue. But I wanted to go home. I wanted to get a job. I didn't want to farm anymore. I got a job. And I wanted to go home on Friday nights and watch Magnum PI and have my little family. That was my that was my dream at that point, because I was so grateful to be alive. I didn't care about anything else. And I wanted to have my family, and I wanted to do it right. Now I understand. I got this big book. We do this 12 steps. And I can share it with you, and you can do it, blah, blah, blah. I worked for the treatment center as a volunteer for people coming out of treatment into our area. Went to my first AA meeting um, at, in Greensburg, Kansas. And I walk in, and it's at this little motel hospitality room thing. It was really small, like a motel room, really. And here's the, right over here is sitting the uh, county sheriff. Over here is the former county attorney. Over here is a ditch digger that worked for my dad, and I'd actually gone out and helped him, like when he was working for my dad. My dad would throw me into the mix, you know, so that it would get the work done faster and wouldn't cost my dad. So I knew all these guys, and they knew me, but they had no idea I'd been to treatment. And I thought they were going to fall out of their chairs when they saw me. Because I didn't ever hide my substance abuse much. Everybody knew that I was, I was an advocate for doing drugs. I believed in it. I'd sell it. I was a religion. It was a religion to me. It was like, I'd, make you, I'd say, yeah, come on, don't be so boring. Come on, you can do it. When I walked in there, these guys fell all over themselves. Because they, that is a dream of, an al of recovering alcoholics need somebody to tell their story to and need somebody to help. And I, I was a prime. And believe me, when I quit selling or quit doing drugs in that town, there was probably a huge reduction in drug abuse in that town because I, I was their source. And so it was a big deal. Not just for me, for a lot of people. Um, and I went to, uh, 
I went to that AA meeting, and then the sheriff said, "Well, Bill, I'll take you." He talked like he said, "Bill, I'll take you to." He's a good old boy. Bill, I'll take you to you. There's another meeting over in Pratt. I'll I'll give you a ride over there. How about that? And I said, "Fine, that'd be great." And so I don't remember where he picked me up, but he probably picked me up at home, as a matter of fact. Picked me up in the cop car. <laughs> so my worst nightmare was I, I never got arrested once. I got picked up once, and they should have arrested me, and he let me go twice, probably three times, four times, probably multiple times they should have let, they should have been. The one time that I know they shouldn't have let me go was uh, they caught me with some marijuana and it was like three joints fell out of my billfold when I tried to get my driver's license out and I started bawling and the guys, and at that time they had a law where if you, if it's your first offense, you've never been arrested before and it's under an ounce or under a quarter of an ounce, the officer had the uh, option to let you go and if you got caught again that they hold you on both counts. And so he let me go. And then the next time, the other time was this same sheriff had found me passed out by the road and my car was dead and I was sitting there. So he came up to the window and said, what's going on, Bill? And I said, uh, I'm trying to get your truck started. He said, well, he said, if you start your truck, I'd have to take you in there to county jail. And how about this? How about if I give you a ride home? He gave me a ride home that night. That was the other time I was in a cop car. But... So I'm riding to Pratt, Kansas in the cop car to go to my second AA meeting. He's having a good time. He's got his radar, clicking his radar off and on in front of, like we'd be following somebody and you'd see the radar detectors in they used to sit on the dash. He'd be clicking that thing off and said, watch that up there. See that light coming on? He said, they know I'm clicking my radar. He was having a good time just messing with people. Um, and I went to my second AA meeting in that car and it was like, it was amazing. Um, uh, and that goes to Romans 7.25 which says the answer, thank God, remember the, the question was, the real question was, is there no hope, who, is there no one who can do anything for me? And the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. That's the message version. So I return home, I wanted everything to live happily ever after. It didn't happen. Um, I was able to uh, uh, manage to be with my wife for about another year. Uh, and it's not her fault. It's not my fault. I couldn't. It's both our fault. If you want to look at it that way. Uh, she was not ready to stop. And uh, I was going crazy with my codependency. Is like this, this. It's a compulsion to help other people. So one of my things that I ended up and I won't talk that whole story out. But one of the things I ended up having to do later on when I became a drug and alcohol counselor was I had to go deal with my need to fix people. So if, if you came in to see me as a client and I gave you the 12 steps, I gave you my best shot, and you didn't want to do it, that drove me crazy. I, didn't, I, I had to give people the choice. And I had to give myself off, let myself off the hook. It wasn't up to me to cure everybody. And that's what I talk to you guys all about in practicum and in all my classes about. You've got to have that, get to that point in your life to see that you can't do this. You can't help other people to help yourself. It's nice when it works out that way. It's nice when you get the benefit of watching somebody grow. But nine times out of ten, that ain't going to happen. You're not going to see it happen. Or it's not going to happen if they're going to look like they rejected you. And you never, you're just planting seeds a lot of times. And you just have to be happy with that. Be the happy seed planter. Um, but I... At one point, I had to go get help, and I tried to, and this manifested itself in my relationship to my poor wife, because she could not, she married me as a drug distributor crazy man. I mean, she, and I basically had forced her into marrying me. Uh, she was like eight years younger than me. Um, I was ready to settle down and be a farmer, or whatever. She was not, that, that was not something that she, even, we, it's like we both woke up in, when I became sober and looked at each other and said, who are you? She had beliefs that I couldn't handle. And I'm sure I had beliefs that she couldn't handle. She started running around. She once still went out on the weekends and partied. And she, I heard rumors that she was seeing somebody. And one night I went up to this where this party was going on. And I had bundled up my daughter because I'd gotten all righteously angry about it. I'm going to catch him in the act. And I bundled up my little girl 
and put her in the car seat, and it's like 11 o'clock at night, she was in bed, and I whipped up to this house, and I walk in this house, and there's my wife passed out on the floor. It's a, it's a party, there's people all over the place. There's my wife passed out on the floor, and there's this guy that she was supposedly with passed out in the other chair, and there, it was just, and I looked around, and I said, what am I doing here? And I thought about my daughter being out in the car in the middle of the night, I'm going nuts. I'm crazy. And that's when I made a decision that we needed to be separated. I needed to take that step away. And we actually went to the, she didn't fight me for custody because I'll give her credit for this, a lot of credit for this. Um, she saw that I was of two people where our baby could go besides other people like foster care, which I could also have seen have happened. Um, she saw that I was probably going to be the more stable parent and she didn't fight me she didn't and part of that's maybe she didn't have the wherewithal to do that but she went to the lawyer we used the same lawyer and went to court and um, and so that's a long story my daughter is now that daughter is uh, a nurse and can works for Kansas uh, KU Medical, Medical Center has an I have a grandson with from uh, Lennox uh, who just turned six my oldest son from my first marriage, he lives in Meade, Kansas. He, he's a, he works for an elevator uh, as a manager. And um, his wife and him have two children. And they're happy. They like the farm life. They like that country life. Meade, Kansas is not, probably was smaller. After Greens, they did live in Greensburg, Kansas. And after it got blown away in the tornado, he moved to, to Meade. Um, and um, he shares my interest in rock hunting, which we didn't really, we weren't around much together. But it was really weird. I went to visit him kind of the first time we kind of got back to I would go, he would come to my parents' house and visit, even when I was using, and that's the way I got to see him when he was younger. And then when I moved to Lawrence, it became harder to see him and after he grew up and his 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 mom remarried and he had a stepdad. And after he moved out, I eventually made more of a contact with him. And uh, it was really bizarre because he likes the same music I like. His voice sounded almost identical to mine. He has the same sense of humor. He, uh, I apparently, when he, I was, he was much younger, had given him a bunch of uh, souvenirs I collected as a child, like from the Smithsonian Institution, little dinosaur, little metal dinosaurs and stuff. I walk into his house where he'd been partying at that time, and his shelves were covered with all this stuff that I'd given him. It was the weirdest darn thing I ever saw. Because I didn't realize how much that meant to him. And I think in high school when we came back, we went back and stayed there when my wife, my Valerie, who hopefully will be coming to talk to you about medical stuff. When we got married, we moved back to Greensburg where my parents were still alive and he was still there. And he, it really threw a kink in his relationship with his mom and his stepdad, and I think it freaked him out. And he sort of he wrote me a letter. He said, I'll still come over and visit you, but I'm not going to move in with you. Because I had this vision of getting my parental rights. I even went and talked to a lawyer and all that. And after I did that, I thought, I'm crazy. i got to get a, I just, I gotta get a handle on this, right? I, I'm crazy. i got to remember that. Because I make those kind of decisions, and I don't think about the consequences. So I don't know what they are. And so I... I backed off, and now we have a great relationship, as good as it probably could be. Um, I still miss him a lot because there's still a part of me that wants to go back and repair what's been done. My daughter and I have a great relationship, although she reminds me of things, like I said, uh, when she was living with me as a single parent, I did not have a very good filter on what kind of movies we watched and those kind of things because it just I came out of this crazy place where I'd been living for like 14 years. Well, I didn't live as crazily. I'd say the five or six years when my wife left me and probably the years when I was in college the first time were the craziest. The, it was really the craziest was when the cocaine came out. And uh, but that was insane. And I probably died several times or should have died several times just from doing so many drugs that, because you couldn't quit. I couldn't quit once I started. And if, if it ran out, that's how I quit. Uh, if there wasn't cocaine, it was methamphetamine. I had a connection in Pratt. Pratt, Kansas has always played as part of my recovery and my sickness. And he did meth. He shot, they inter intravenously shot meth. And if I couldn't get cocaine, I'd go there and get that to 
tied me over. Uh, but methamphetamines, uh, methamphetamine crystal meth lasts, you can stay up, as I've heard people longer than this, but five days without even shooting in your vein. That means you don't sleep. You can't eat because it's, a anti, it's what they use for diet, dieting. Most amphetamines, they used to give that as diet pills to housewives. Uh, because it suppresses your, your, it really suppresses it. I mean to the point that after a binge, people will, um, like me, would somehow your body would be telling you, you've got to eat, you've got to eat. And I couldn't, I'd go to buy a hamburger and you take a bite of the hamburger and it's like chewing a piece of styrofoam and I couldn't swallow it. There was no, I was so dehydrated from drinking beer and not eating and not drinking water that I couldn't swallow it. And I think, I'm gonna die. And I, what I end up doing was I'd get a milkshake then and drink and I could drink it. And the milkshake got nutrients into my system. And then it, if I drank that long enough, then eventually I'd get enough, uh, and then I'd pass out, sleep. And then I'd wake up, and I remember uh, eating, a, like my second wife would fix me a meal, and I'd be eating the meal, and one time I fell asleep and my head hit the plate, I'd pass out again. Because I didn't have any sleep for five days. I mean, your body's just going, you gotta sleep, gotta eat, gotta sleep, gotta eat. That's all it would let me do. And then I'd wake up after about a day of sleeping. Guess what happened? I remember, I'll give this, I'll end with this. It's a horrible story, but it's, it illustrates that it's a perfect story for addiction. Um, this was back when I was dealing cocaine. And um, you would drink and deal co cocaine. You couldn't stay up as long because you'd pass out sooner. And I passed out. And the alcohol probably sedated me and I passed out. And I remember waking up and thinking, my dad's going to come out. He's going to expect me to work, and I've got to get up. And I got to, I got to get up and do something, because at that time I was supposedly running the farm. I was running the farm into the ground, but I was trying to run the farm for him. Um, and I remember crawling out of this waterbed that I'd passed out on, and I'm literally getting down on my hands and knees on the floor, and crawling over to the desk where I thought I might have left the cocaine and digging through drawers and finding empty things and finally finding enough to do a little bit of cocaine and then being able to get up, walk to the kitchen down the hall to the other end of the house, open the refrigerator, pop the top on a beer. That's addiction. That is the final, I, I'm lucky to be alive. Lucky to have any brain. So when, I for, when I'm forgetful, you guys just quit teasing me about it. I tease myself about it. Um, I think stress has more to do with forgetfulness than that. But you're stressed out. Anyway, do you have any questions? This is your chance. Ask me anything you want. I have a question. Okay. It really doesn't necessarily pertain to you, but how long, like when somebody is a drug addict and they go into withdrawals, how long, you know, you see in the movies where the people are like sweating and they're like aching. How long does that act, that part actually last? It depends on a whole bunch of things. It depends on what drug we're talking about. It depends, like, there are uh, Valium. You'll go through withdrawals once and it has a half-life of like two weeks. And you can literally go through withdrawals again in two weeks if you've been taking it. Like, they used to prescribe that as a mother's little helper for housewives because it just made you feel good. You know, if you're anxious, it's good. And they, kind of like methamphetamine, they used to, not methamphetamine, but they used to use amphetamines for dieting. Um, alcohol, uh, usually it's four to five days. And, but again, then it depends on the dosage that you've been using. So the, an old guy who drinks a fifth of whiskey a day, um, and I may have been drinking that much alcohol itself a day with my constant beer drinking, but probably not. I probably wouldn't be able to get that much into my system. I wouldn't have as much into my system at once as a guy that's sitting there drinking out of a bottle of whiskey because it's more, it's got higher alcohol content. So four or five days with alcohol, with methamphetamine, you don't really know, I don't know, three or four days, up to two years. And I would say that because on any of these med, uh, chemicals, even though the chemical is no longer in your system, 
the effects of the chemical are still there. So you could, if you want to redefine withdrawal, methamphetamine, people that are on methamphetamine, they've done brain studies, and there's probably more updated ones than I know about, but for two years, you're stuck in this place where you don't have the good, feel-good chemicals anymore available. That you, you, all, you guys all have serotonin and dopamine available to you. So when you get a good grade on a test, you're yeah, or you know you won the game, you know, you get a rush. People that have gotten off of drugs, what happens with the methamphetamine and cocaine is it, it, it drains, it, it makes you, it stimulates your brain to release all those chemicals at once. So the first high on cocaine is fan, is the most, it's like you can't even imagine it. But the next high is less because you've already drained your dopamine. And if you keep doing it, you've drained all those chemicals out of your system, and your system doesn't just instantly re refill it, you know. It takes a long time for your body to refill it. So, somebody that's got a long history or has been doing a lot of cocaine, for, they say up to two years, you can have this, um, it's like a, it's like you're walking around, everything's foggy, you know, like on a foggy day. There's no happy, there's no real serious depression, maybe, but there's no joy. And the problem is your brain cognitively knows there's one way I can feel good. And they go back. That's why relapse is so prominent in all chemicals. It's not just that because if I quit doing alcohol and my wife's out doing something that I, or I see somebody, you know, I'm upset about something, I know one thing that make me feel good. Or used to. Even, even the fact that it didn't make me feel good anymore, your, your brain remembers that first time and you can't ever forget the first time. You cannot go back. It, I wish you could erase it. Now, I, I've been really blessed. I don't feel that uh, compulsion to use. But I had a lot of other compulsions, so I'm not sure if that, some of those others might have covered some of that up. But I've been in AA meetings for people that have been two or three or four years sober still have cravings to use. And I tell you, that crap, I don't, I don't ever want to touch it again. I don't have, but I, today, I know well enough not to say it that way. Just, I need to say it. Today, I don't have that craving and I'm not going to do it today. And that's all I have to do. Because if I say I'll never do it again, what if I did get a craving? I wouldn't be re ready. But if I acknowledge that I'm powerless over alcohol and my life has become unmanageable, that's the first step, then I'm always, re I, don't, I don't even, I mean, I'm, today I know I'm powerless and that's all I need to know. <laughs> and I've turned my will and my life over to the care of God. And I've done the other things that I needed to do through Celebrate Recovery and AA. That's what keeps me sober. That's what I, it's, a, it's my insurance policy. I pay my insurance policy. Doing this is a kind of an insurance policy. Although it's supposed to be anonymous, so I kind of break one of the rules by telling you guys about it. Any other questions? Okay. Any? Sure. Any? Is it? All right. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I appreciate you guys so much. And uh, uh, that was scary. Because I'm sitting.